Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's uh, presentation. We're going to uh, talk about uh, Spring and uh, Hibernate 6 uh, migration. I hope that you can hear me well. We have here two options. If you want to ask me questions throughout this presentation, I think you have two options. One is to use the QA, Q&A uh, feature from Zoom. The other one is probably the, the chat. And uh, I'm going to, uh, when I'm going to, I'm going to make actually multiple breaks when I'm talking about a certain section and I'm going to try to uh, answer your, uh, answer your question, questions. And then we were, we're also going to have at, uh, at the end of the presentation, uh, a dedicated slot for even more uh, questions to address them. So first of all, thanks for uh, joining in. And uh, I hope that you are going to enjoy this presentation that uh, we're going to go through uh, today. Now, first of all, why um, why we're even uh, running this uh, presentation? Because this is a uh, this is a new presentation I created uh, uh, over the uh, over the past uh, three months. Is because uh, as you very well may know that uh, Spring uh, at the end of two thousand and twenty two, Spring has uh, released this uh, a new version, a new major version, Spring six which of course brings uh, has this Hibernate 6 dependency. And uh, this combo is actually uh, extremely popular for uh, developing Java web and enterprise applications. And uh, in the long run, you're going to consider this migration. And because it's not uh, a, a, a drop-in replacement, a trivial migration, I think that you are going to learn some tips, which myself, I also got to learn uh, while I was migrating two open source projects that I'm developing. One is um, the Hypersistence Utils project, which provides you with Hibernate types and um, many other utilities. And the other one is this Hyperformance Java Persistence GitHub repository that I'm using for a lot of things, like for my blog, for uh, for courses, training, and stuff like that. All right, so now a little bit about myself. My name is Vlad Mihacha. I'm an independent Java champion. Uh, nowadays, I used to work for Red Hat on the Hibernate project back in uh, back in the days. Uh, now, mostly, I'm focusing on uh, writing on my own blog. I try to blog every week uh, and uh, share the findings that uh, that I discover while using uh, Spring and Hibernate, which is also uh, one of the thing. Uh, some of the things that I discovered, I also I'm going to share with you in this presentation. This is my Twitter um, handler, and this is the GitHub repository. We are going to make some references to the uh, the projects that uh, I also migrated, and you can use those as a reference as well. If you want to take a look, see exactly how I migrated because they are open source, they are available on GitHub. So you have access to the Git log to see exactly uh, what I did myself. Now I see that there are some questions on the chat. Uh, yeah, so right from the start, this is a common uh, common question. Uh, some of you may have, uh, the, the whole session is recorded and uh, it's going to be shared uh, on the Pentabar uh, on the Pentabar web uh, page uh, in the events, there's going to be a dedicated section for this uh, uh, for this uh, webinar that we're running today. So don't worry if you if you didn't uh, have the time to uh, join it or if you uh, don't have the time to attend it till the end. There's uh, you're not going to lose the entire webinar because we are actually recording it right now. All right, so. Let's get started. One of the very first things that uh, you are going to uh, you, you are going to have to do when you are going to migrate to Hibernate six is uh, the fact that you need to uh, migrate to Java seventeen because the minimum version for Spring uh, six is now uh, Java seventeen. For um, for Hibernate six, Hibernate six is is built using Java. 11. But because Spring 6 is built using Java 17, you don't have any other choice but to use at least Java 17. You can use uh, even newer versions, but you have to um, make a migration to at least Java 17. And that's a great thing because there are many features in Java that you can benefit from. And I'm going to show you some of them. I see that we have some question here. Are you using some dependable for dependencies upgrades for your project? 
uh, actually, I can't even miss not using it because uh, on GitHub, I'm being uh, notified uh, every week about uh, the state of dependencies in my project. So yes, I get to see what dependencies uh, I'm using and uh, whether I need to upgrade. In in my case, I can share you uh, the point of view between uh, me as an application developer and me as an open source project developer because it's a little bit different. When I'm developing an application, I'm using Spring, I'm using Hibernate, I'm using other tools. I try to use those tools as much as uh, tools as much as possible because they are convenient and they provide me with a lot of value without having me to reinvent the wheel, uh, which would be both complicated and the solution probably less uh, optimal than using something that's battle tested of uh, these uh, frameworks. Now that's one thing, but in uh, in these applications, we tend to use many dependencies. And of course, when we try to upgrade, you will have to take care of them. If you're an open source developer, if you have a project, then you have a different mindset. You want to mini, you, you want to use the minimal number of dependencies because the more dependencies you are going to depend on, the more you are tied to the life cycle of other projects. Let's say that now I want to support Hibernate 6 and I'm also dependent on some other library which is not being uh, maintained or upgraded to be compatible with Hibernate 6, I'd be in trouble. So I have a different mindset based on what I'm using. If I'm using an application, I, I can afford using multiple dependencies. Otherwise, I'll try to minimize that use. So yes, I'm using Dependabot as well. Uh, Hibernate 6 is possible even without uh, Spring 6. In fact, uh, you can use Hibernate 6 with uh, with Quarkus as well, or uh, you can use Hibernate 6 with uh, Jakarta uh, EE, which is uh, now, you know, we used to have Java EE, and now it's called Jakarta EE. So you can use it. Uh, actually, uh, there is, um, I'm not sure if you can use it with Spring 5, Hibernate 6, because it's it works, as you will see. Uh, it uh, basically needs... Um, it uses a different namespace for Jakarta persistence, but uh, you can use it with other frameworks if you want. Now, I see there are a lot of questions on the chat. I hope that I'm going to uh, go through all of them. So one of the very first things that you will do, you'll have to upgrade to Java 17. And uh, why it's nice, actually, to to embrace Java 17? You have text blocks. Now, look, look how nicely uh, the queries look when you're using the query annotation, which is also very popular. Actually, uh, I wrote recently an article about when it's good to use the Spring Data JPA query methods, you know, the me query methods where you derive the query from the method name, which is nice as long as the query method is not very large. And uh, the query, you can basically derive a, a rather trivial query. Uh, but when the query becomes more complex, having a huge or very long uh, uh, method where from which you derive the query would not be very uh, useful. And it's, all, it's also very limited, but then you can use the query annotation and then you can use text blocks and it's, it looks so much better than it used to, uh, we used to have before, before Java 17. And that's not the only thing. Now you have, uh, you also have support for uh, records. Now a record is a, uh, it's a more compact way of declaring uh, a value object or a data transport object. You, you know, previously you'd have to write the DTO as a POJO. You'd have to create the fields, the getter, setters, constructor, equals hash code to string. Some of you uh, would uh, use uh, Lombok to, to try to avoid all that uh, boilerplate. And uh, nowadays you don't really need that because you have records Creating a record is as simple as that. And then you can use it uh, in your DTO projections. You cannot use records to uh, as a substitute for entities because entities uh, in the JP specification and the concept of entities relies on the fact that the entity is mutable, that it can intercept the changes, detect changes, and then propagate and synchronize uh, the state of the entity with the database. A lot of optimizations that Hibernate has, like automatic batch uh, batch updates, uh, like uh, concurrency control um, uh, features, like optimistic locking, or uh, many other uh, features, are very much rely on the fact that the entity is mutable. That's why you cannot use a record uh, to replace an entity, but you can use it just fine 
for DTO projections. And DTO projections are actually very useful because if you have, if you only need to fetch four columns from multiple uh, tables, like when you have joins, you don't need to select everything from or from both or multiple tables because that's going to take more than necessary. You're going to create an overhead that's not needed, only to discard the extra columns that you don't need. So then just fetch just as much uh, as you uh, as you need to fulfill your business use case and you'd be fine. Okay, another question here. How frameworks like Micronode are able to use records as entities because they don't use Hibernate. They use a different paradigm. They use something like Active Record. That's why they uh, they can... So if you're using something like, uh, for instance, I can give you an example. Like Scala uses something like Sleek. Or, and uh, in, in Scala, you have immutable objects, immutable collections. But the way that uh, that framework is created it's uh, more uh, it's similar to active record or something like that not as um, it, it doesn't embrace this uh, uh, persistence context uh, paradigm where you have your entities that uh, and in the context of the persistence context you have only one entity representing a given database table record which can automatically synchronize at flush time which provides a lot of optimizations in fact this is very similar to how database systems work because that the persistence context in JP is exactly like the buffer pool is in the database and you have these synchronizations happen at flush time, which happens also because uh, at, at that flush time, you can do all sort of uh, write-based optimizations. That's why there are different approaches. There's none one which is better than the other. And uh, in reality, you can even mix them if you want. Just like you can mix Hibernate with Juke or with Query DSL, you can uh, and you can benefit from different uh, uh, the different approaches. All right. Some people say we use Kotlin for all new projects. No need for Lombok. Okay, so in Kotlin, maybe you have something that's uh, already um, that addresses this. But for the uh, Kotlin uh, has been. Um, increasing its market share, but still Java, it's uh, hugely popular and it's going to be extremely popular for uh, for many years to come. And it's good to, keep, to, to be up to date, especially if you, let's say that uh, you are going to join a new project, which is using, uh, uh, now it's using Spring 6 and it's using Java 17. And to be familiar with the features that now you can take advantage uh, of because you are using Java 17. Other things, like for instance, now you have this uh, pattern matching or auto casting, for instance. Of now, for instance, like we are having this example, you can uh, you can stream over uh, a list of subscribers, and then if you're using instance of inside in the block there, you don't need to cast anymore because that uh, the object is going to be the cast are going to be actually in, uh, injected by the compiler at compile time. But it's um, easier to write it that way. You have that, for instance, of you also have it for in the switch expression, so that you don't have to do those costs. So if the if a given uh, subscriber is of this type, then you can automatically uh, access uh, that type specific uh, uh, methods without doing any cost anymore. So you don't have to cast from this uh, base type. So those are some nice uh, enhancements that you can uh, benefit from. But the bulk, and I would say uh, where it's going to be uh, both directly and indir indirectly is the fact that now Spring 6 uses Hibernate 6, which has migrated to Jakarta persistence. You know that previously we had Java E, which was having, uh, Java E is a, an umbrella of specifications among which you also have the Java persistence API. But nowadays it's called Jakarta persistence. And uh, the namespace has changed. So in, instead of Javax persistence, now you have to do a replace to use Jakarta persistence. This is your direct change that you are, you are going to uh, have to do in your code. Like for instance, I have in this project here, for instance, I'm uh, I have this Jakarta persistence as you can see here. Otherwise, it would not uh, it would not work. That's one direct change. But then there are also indirect changes that you uh, you will have to do. Like for instance, uh, you would have to make sure that all the other dependencies, not only Spring, maybe you are relying on other dependencies, like uh, for instance, which use 
which uh, used to use Javax persistence, and now they need to use Jakarta persistence. Like, for instance, uh, transaction managers or like Blaze Pers the way that Blaze persistence works. Any plugin that uh, adds something to uh, JP or Hibernate would have to be upgraded as well. And that's an indirect change that might prevent you or might make it uh, much more uh, complex to make this, uh, this migration. All right. And uh, other things like that was Jakarta Persistent 3.0. They only changed the namespace, but then they also added some new features in Jakarta Persistent 3.1. One of them, it looks very appealing, but it's not very useful, is the fact that you can use UIDs, these Java UIDs version 4, as, uh, for instance, as uh, identifiers. You can actually use them even for basic types, but uh, they say in the specification that you can use them as, as an identifier strategy. That looks very convenient, but it's not actually. In reality, it's a terrible idea. Why? Because these UIDs are actually uh, the version 4, are uh, not only that they're huge, they take 128 uh, bits, but actually they are random. And uh, because they are random, and because you were using them for primary keys, which might have associated foreign keys, it means that they affect the B plus three indexes. Because you are going to have, for performance reasons, you are going to have an, um, a, you are going to have an index on the primary key and on the foreign key, because otherwise, you will have to do full table scans. That's in most databases. In some databases like MySQL or SQL Server, the entire database looks like this. The entire, uh, sorry, the entire table that has a primary key is a clustered index and looks like this. So that would be a table having a primary key in SQL Server or a regular table in MySQL. The table looks like this. It's basically an index. Is the index of the prim primary key and these in the leaves, that's where the records are. And if you're using a random UID, what it means? It means that every time you're coming with a new random value, which will have to, and the, the record will have to be added uh, somewhere here, but coming with random value, it means that you have to create a lot of pages that have a very low fill factor, and you are doing a lot of uh, splits and merges between uh, the left and the right side of the index because the index itself is balanced. That's what B plus three means. It means that it's balanced and uh, it has to maintain this balance between the left and the right side of the index. And for all these reasons, this is MySQL, this is SQL Server, but also for Oracle, for Postgres, which use uh, a heap tables and separated uh, uh, indexes for primary keys. In those cases, it's the same thing. The index is huge. If it's huge for the primary key, it takes a lot of space. It's going to be, the problem is going to be amplified for the foreign key columns. And also this randomness is not, is going to basically, we are going to end up with an index that takes a lot of space on the disk, but it doesn't contain a lot of values because uh, we keep on adding them into pages that have very low fill factor. So for all these reasons, I would say that, uh, reconsider that. Yes, using, like someone says here, using a sequence, it's almost always much better to do it or using something that's time sorted, like a time sorted identifiers. There are many uh, solutions one we can find in this high persistence utils open source project. So keep in mind, you have a new feature, but every time, you have a new feature, think about whether it's really is going to be useful, not only from one point of view, from multiple points of view. Jakarta Persistent 3.1 adds new functions. Ceiling floor, these are going to be uh, useful in certain uh, arithmetic uh, operations for, uh, this is for mathematicals like uh, exponential uh, power around the sign. If you're doing some, um, um, arithmetic operations, you can use those. And the nice thing is that these are available in JPQL and Criteria API, so they can get translated to the proper database-specific syntax. And that's that's very nice. In fact, you can see it in action, and that I would say this is even more uh, is going. This is going to be very useful uh, because I've been observing over the uh, over the last years the fact that whenever you have to do some uh, time and date uh, transformation, uh, you would have to use uh, methods which are extremely different from one database to the other. The fact that now JPQL has this unified 
um, daytime processing functions is great because it allows you to translate the query to the proper database specific uh, um, query and that makes it uh, much more portable if you have to support multi if you're developing an uh, an application that you uh, you want to uh, you, you want to have it, you want to have multiple you don't want to impose your clients a given database you want it to be flexible so the clients can can choose their own uh, database now someone asked about ul id actually there's also going to be the lexical uh, identifier there's also going to be uh, uid version 8 or something like that which is going to be time sorted that's going to be better from the fact that it's sorted so that's um, going to address one problem but the fact that it takes 128 bits it's still going to be it's still going to take a lot of space and if you have a huge database like with 101 billion uh, records overall then with a lot of indexes you are going to occupy a lot of space in the buffer pool just to store uh, the ids more space than necessary if you can use sequences you can uh, for instance if you can use an int that's going to take uh, to take one quarter of the amount of space required by uid other things that you have uh the entity manager and entity manager factory now are auto closable so if you have to do some programmatic uh, if you have to uh, open close uh, then programmatically do it in a try with resources block and benefit from this auto closable that's not something that uh, that normally you'd uh, do other than probably in some tests but at least it's it's good that we have it that was also available previously in the session and the session factory but now you have it in uh, in the session and uh, you have it in the jpa interfaces some questions here so using uid as a natural identifier would not be a good idea in terms of if you're indexing you still have the same issue it's the fact that if you're using it for primary keys it's worse because you have foreign keys pointing to this primary key so you amplify the prob uh, problem with every new foreign key using natural identifier is probably going to be isolated this problem to a single uh, only to the index that uh, is associated to this column but then think about it why would you need a uid as a natural identifier why, why would you need it? If you need it only to hide the ID, uh, you can use external IDs that you only generate uh, and store them in Redis just for the purpose of uh, of hiding the IDs if you want. And it's not you're not going to pay the price of using these huge UIDs in the database. Now, we, we're going to address the next questions. We're going to uh, address some of them when uh, we are uh, going to the next things that have been added to JPQL. One thing here, why is validation with Spring is not working on records when using as DTOs? I don't know, but basically this sounds like a great question for Stack Overflow. Probably there is some issue there, or maybe on the uh, forum, actually on, uh, I think that Spring doesn't have a dedicated forum for that, those they, use, they are using, uh, they are using uh, Stack Overflow for that. All right, now, uh, related to um, the parser, um, in Hibernate 5, this is the way that JPQL and Criteria API used to be parsed. Because basically, think about it. Criteria API is a Java API, is a library, like a, like a library, which you can use to build queries dynamically, programmatically. But in the end, in Hibernate uh, 5, uh, criteria API would generate a JPQL like a string and that string has to be parsed from string you create you uh, hibernate parses it creates an abstract syntax tree traverses it and then generates the database specific SQL query that's how uh, it that's how the hibernate 5 parser used to work now in hibernate 6 there's a new parser it's called SQM and both JPQL and criteria API are basically parsed to this SQM and that one is used to generate the SQL. Now, what, why it's great to have it like that is because now you can concentrate and add all the features here, which will benefit both JPQL and Criteria API. And we are going to see what exactly. For instance, now in Hibernate 6, you can have window functions in JPQL and Criteria API. Why would you want to use window functions? Because they are very useful. You can, for instance, in this case, this is a cumulative sum. I mean, you cannot, if you're using group by, 
Gruba is a is a re reduction operation because it it reduces the result set to one record per partition. But that the window function doesn't do that. It retains the original uh, result set and can add new columns that can also do um, all sort of aggregations like this cumulative sum. But you have a lot of them. You have dense rank. Uh, you have there. Um, uh, for percentiles, you have a lot of functions. You have uh, uh, leg, lead. You can go and you can define this partition dynamically. You have a lot of features. And now you can benefit from uh, from these window functions, not only in uh, uh, native SQL queries. You have the same in JPQL and Criteria API queries. You also have derived tables. What's a derived table? When you do something like select from, and then you have another select, a subselect there, that's a derived table. This is the proper uh, term to uh, name this feature. And that's useful, why? Because derived tables allow you to override the default SQL operation order. For instance, you can have, like in this case here, we are uh, basically counting the number of uh, comments, and then we are using dense rank to rank uh, the posts by their number of columns in order to do uh, for maybe we're going to do um, a further filtering. But basically having derived tables allow you to write this type. This is a JPQL query. This is not native SQL. Previously, the only way you would uh, use derived tables was if you're uh, using native SQL. Now you also have it in JPQL. And of course, in Criteria API, because what now you have in JPQL, you already have it in Criteria API. You also have union, union all, the difference between union and union all is the same like in SQL because this basically renders the uh, associated SQL query. Union is like union all plus this thing. And then you also have except, you also have uh, intersect, intersect all. These are JPQL queries that are going to be, um, that are going to generate the SQL query that's pretty much similar to the one that we're, uh, we have written here. We didn't have all these features before. But now you have it in JPQL. So a lot of things have been added to Hibernate 6. One thing that might bother you is the fact that the legacy criteria, this was uh, popular in Hibernate 3. This one is gone now. It's, it's been deprecated. It was deprecated for a very long time. I, I think that since Hibernate 4 or something like that. And it got deprecated. So if you migrate to Hibernate 6 and in your project, you still use this session create criteria queries, now you will have to migrate to Criteria API or to something else. So instead of those, you will have to use Criteria API, which basically, I don't know who designed it, but it's extremely developer unfriendly. I It's one of those APIs where after 30 minutes, when you finish writing your query, you have no idea what you wrote there. So coming back later, one uh, next day, you have no idea what you wrote it because I don't, I don't know why, who designed it, but it's very hard to parse it. In reality, I'm not even using that. I'm going to show exactly what I'm using most of the time, but let me take a quick look on, on the chat and on the question. Okay, is there something related to window function? Why use window functions in JPQL? Why not use J window functions in JPQL? Uh, someone asked, why use it in JPQL and not in SQL? Maybe you're building, maybe you're using the window functions because JPQL is needed because you need to fetch entities, but window functions can be used for all sorts of things, including for filtering and derived tables. So you can fetch your entity. And uh, like in the previous case, you could fetch um, entities with uh, with all their commons, like all, post with all their commons, but filter by uh, not by the product of this join, but by the number of posts instead of doing two queries. That would be a very a, a valid use case where we would benefit from window functions and we would still be fetching uh, entities. What do you want to use as a P key, uh, primary key if you want to hide that? You can, you, you can use a sequence and if you want to hide it, you can use an external ID. So you can generate an external ID that you can store in Redis if you want. And then you can use that external ID and when you, you do in the application, the trans, translation between one and the other. So you only expose the uh, external ID, which is temporary. You only store it in in uh, Redis. There it's very quick to, to, to get it. 
and to find the actual ID of the table. And if you do it like that, it's not uh, going to, you don't really, you don't really need to persist that in the database because it's uh, some value that's only needed for the duration of your business use case. All right. So that would be the criteria API, but the criteria API, there, there are alternatives to it. For instance, you can use Blaze Persistence. Blaze Persistence is a is a framework that's like a plugin for JP and Hibernate. Uh, it's an open source framework. It's developed by Christian Bakov, and Christian Bakov also works on the Hibernate project. Nowadays, a lot of things that uh, were previously available only in Blaze Persistence, he added support in Hibernate 6. So he did a lot of um, advancements and in introduced a lot of new features in uh, Hibernate 6. But actually one thing why I like Blaze Persistence because you can write much more advanced queries even in Hibernate 5 or in Spring uh, 5 or Spring Boot uh, 2. You could have used Blaze Persistence and write and have derived tables, lateral joins, window functions and create them dynamically. Uh, it's basically like this. It's much more fluent and it's much easier to read. It's uh, I, I think that uh, the query, it's much easier to understand exactly what happens be, uh, behind the scenes. You also have uh, extensions for the JPA criteria. Previously, there were some features probably that were, were only available in JPQL, but not in criteria API. Now there is this feature called criteria extensions where you can get access to features that are available in JPQL and are not available in Criteria API because the JPA spe specification didn't add support for them. But Hibernate, having added support, uh, having added support for them, you can get them. For instance, using by just casting, or basically using the Hibernate specific uh, classes. Like when you do Entity Manager get Criteria Builder, you get a Criteria Builder, but it's of the type Hibernate Criteria Builder, so you have access to uh, the Hibernate specific classes, which have more methods than what uh, JPA provides you. All right, let's see some more questions here. I don't know exactly where I'm left with them. So let me, let me mark the one which I, uh, which I answered. Okay, validation. Can the JPA specification be adapted or changed to support immutable structures like record? No, it cannot. Uh, it cannot be done because basically uh, an immutable record could would never benefit from dirty checking, would never be able to do automatic batching and uh, merging persistence the way that the whole entity straight transitions work would never work with records. And there's no benefit actually to, for you. People think that they read all sorts of things though, like immu you always should have immu immutability. Without that, uh, it's impossible to write application. That's of course, that's, that's extremely wrong to have all these, I would say religious thoughts about software development. In reality, 80% of the entire internet runs in PHP and in JavaScript. The fact that you're using Java, it's actually, way more advanced than the entire internet is being is being run you actually what you really need is proper software engineering to have tests to have integration tests to uh, think about what you're doing to try to make it as simple as possible and to to read the documentation there are very simple things that you can do and you if you apply those you are going to uh, you are going to achieve good results no matter what programming language you are using. You don't need to use a very niche or a very uh, a very specific paradigm and only that can deliver good performance. That's not, uh, that's very far from the truth actually. And the fact that people get very um, uh, ambitious about having immutability uh, with, uh, and thinking that you cannot g uh, develop an application without it, of course, that's, that's just not true. I mean, you can and you can benefit from immutability. You can benefit from functional programming, and you can develop a specific application with that. But that's just that's not a general recipe for any type of application. In fact, you can develop the same application with different paradigms, and if you apply good software engineering practices, you are always going to get a good solution, no matter which path have you chosen. In this case, records 
could be used with active records, but they don't really work well with this concept of persistence context and JPA. So I doubt that they would show it because if they add support for that, they will have to have some different specification for, for that. It's not going to work. And many things that now you appreciate in Spring Data JPA, probably you would not have if you if you use that. So there's a price that you would pay for, uh, for that as well. All right. Better alternative to UID. Yes, I'm using the time sorted ID in the hyper, uh, hypersistence util project, which is more compact. It's not unique. It's more compact. The rate of collision can be very low. And even then, you'd, that would not really be a problem because uh, you'd, you can you have a retry annotation, which on constraint violation exceptions can retry and regenerate uh, a new one, which is extremely rare. But even then, you don't have to you you don't necessarily have to push it back to to the client. All right, so let me see. There are many external jars in Maya that are still using Javax namespace. Yes, that's a big problem. Someone said this is a very good problem. If you're using if you have an application and you want to migrate to Spring 6, which uses Hibernate 6, and use a lot of um, dependencies that are built against Javax, like uh, against the old Java e specifications, not only JPA, many other specifications, basically all those would have to be, you'd have to migrate all of them. And that's probably the most uh, challenging part. It's not what you have to do directly in your code. It's also the dependencies that you have to, to uh, update uh, as well. All right. I'm going to take more questions as soon as possible. Uh, all right. You should use. Um, okay. So this is uh, for, the, for the JPA criteria extensions. Why it's uh, interesting to have it? Because you can use common table expression queries. You can have window function queries as well now in Criteria API and other things in Hibernate 6. If I don't know if you remember in Hibernate 5, uh, there used to be a lot of dialects. If you have, if you had to choose for MySQL, there were MySQL 5.5 dialects, spatial dialects. Uh, there was one my, MySQL 5 spatial dialect, MySQL 8 dialect, a lot of them. And it was uh, most of the time, what would happen, you would uh, choose one of them and that would rarely be changed because it becomes part of your some application property setting and it would stay like that even if you upgrade to a newer version of MySQL or Postgres, whatever database you are using. And nowadays, this is simplified because you no longer have to specify that in order to benefit from new features. There's a single dialect for a given database and then it basically auto de it determines what's the version on the database size and it enables or disables specific features based on the version that you're using. More, you don't even need to specify the dialect manually because it can be uh, resolved automatically. It can figure out what is the associated database based on the database metadata for the, for, for the given connection. So you don't need to specify it anymore. It can be auto discovered. So you can basically remove this property and it's going to work, it's going to work for you. Other things, if you know that in the JPQL and in the, uh, in the specificated JPA specification, you have this distinct keyword, which has different meanings. For instance, if it's a scalar query, like give me all uh, the distinct years when I published a post. How I would do that? If I'm getting the years for every post, I'm going to get the same year for all the posts that I published in, the, uh, in that year. And I don't want to get all those duplicates. So for that, I can use distinct. And then that distinct would be passed to the database. Because in this case, it's good that I pass it on the database side and I'm going to eliminate those duplicates. And in the application, I would get a distinct set of years for all. Uh, for uh, the years where uh, in which I published some posts, but then there was another uh, there, there was another um, use for this distinct. For instance, you would use distinct when you uh, would join parents and uh, children collections. You would do this join between post and comments, and because this join duplicates the post for every comment what happens? You basically are going to end up having this in this list of posts with duplicated uh, references towards the same post for every comment that was being fetched from the database, which is not nice. I mean, 
Normally that should have been deduplicated right from the start, from JPA1, because no one needs that. However, because that's how the standard was written, the standard tells you that you should use this thing to the duplicate, but that this thing only makes sense and it's applied only after the query is executed on the Java side, when the result set is, uh, when the entities are going to be uh, created and returned to you. However, because you're using distinct in Hibernate 5, that distinct would be pushed to the query. And what would happen? If you add it to the query, there's no benefit from it because this post ID here is already unique. So you're not going to remove any duplicate in the SQL query result set. However, because you have that distinct, you would uh, uh, you'd have some extra um, operation steps being executed that you can see in your execution plan. And that's not nice. For instance, you see some extra sort and some extra uh, duplicate uh, phase there that are being executed. And you don't want that, because, uh, you don't want to have that because that's just extra overhead with, without having any benefit for your application. And for that reason, in Hibernate 5, there was this hint called uh, pass this thing through, you would uh, set to false and then distinct that you are, you would be using in JPQL would deduplicate the object references without passing the distinct to the SQL query. So you would not have those extra extra uh, steps for your execution plan. That was in Hibernate 5. In Hibernate 6, you no longer need that because now Hibernate 6 does what JPA 1.0 should have done from the very beginning. It does, out, it, it does the automatic deduplication. So you no longer have those duplicated object references because in reality, no one ever needed those. Those are object references. You, you would have got a duplicated uh, reference towards the same object. There was no benefit for that. And that's one thing which is uh, very useful. Other things you will see when you migrate, if uh, you've been using a lot of custom types, like for instance, for JSON, for arrays, or for other types that you've been using, which were not supported by Hibernate natively, most likely that you've been using this type def annotation in Hibernate 5. You would have this type def annotation, which was actually quite cool because you could say that give a name and you can even apply it for a given, um, for a given entity attribute type but you define it only once and then you could reuse it in many entities. That's gone. It's no longer, you're not going to, to find this anymore. And instead you have to use the type annotation, which now uh, it's type safe. So it doesn't take a name. It only takes a class. So if you have that, you will have to uh, check and for all those uh, mappings where you're using custom type, you'll have to apply the changes because otherwise it will, uh, it will not, uh, it will not work. All right. So that's another, that's another thing. Uh, but uh, there are many other th things. For instance, there are many other annotations that you will find like GDBC type code annotation, which allows you to tell to hibernate what is the actual JDBC type that you want this entity attribute to be handled with. Like for instance, in this case, this is a map. Now, normally you don't use a map for basic properties. You're using a map for one to many uh, collection. You're using a map for element collection. In this case, this is a basic property and we want to save the content of this map. We want to save it in a JSON column. And you can do the same using that Hibernate Utils JSON type that I have in that uh, Hibernate Util uh, Hypersistence Utils open source project. But you also have now in Hibernate 6, you have support for some types natively, like for INET columns, for uh, some arrays, for some JSONs. It's much more limited than what I have in Hypersistence Utils. It only supports some databases, but it's an alternative. So you can do that. For instance, that only works with map. It doesn't work with string, with uh, records, or with other types of properties, but for some limited use cases, you can use uh, that uh, as well. Another thing, I'm not sure if you ever use this, the result transformer. It's a, it's a very useful, actually, uh, it's a very useful feature that uh, normally uh, people would not use because it got deprecated in Hibernate 
it got deprecated because it had two methods instead of one. So you could not use it, you cannot use this interface uh, using uh, uh, as a functional interface and use it to uh, have a lambda to to create a, to, to create the implementation because normally it should have had only this method, but it got two methods and that was only used uh, in a single use case. So for for this reason, this one in Hibernate 6, uh, this one was uh, was split into two interfaces. Previously, why, why I said because uh, why I said about this that's useful is because you can use it to create you can use it to create hierarchies. You can use it to create an hierarchy of uh, DTOs like uh, have a distinct number of posts that have collections of DTOs. Exactly like you're using join fetch for entities, you can do the same for DTOs. Like in this case. I would get only two posts, but one has multiple columns and the other one has only one column. Normally you would get three records and three DTOs in your uh, in your um, result set, but you can use this to to avoid uh, to to reconstruct your result set even before you return the result back to to the caller. And because this was deprecated, a lot of people would uh, would avoid it. But now in Hibernate 6, you no longer have to do that. Because now this result transformer was split into two interfaces, one containing the transform tuple, the other one containing the transform list. So now you have two interfaces and you can use them. And then you are not going to have any deprecation warning anymore, which was uh, frightening people. And they uh, would avoid using a very useful feature that doesn't have any alternative. Of course, the only alternative would be to return something and then transform it later probably in the service layer or in some other methods but uh, why why not have it and uh, encapsulate it in a single method using this transformer for which that's exactly why we have this feature in the first place other things like for instance if you've been using in spring 5 this jt transaction manager for global transactions for uh, jta which allows you to have multiple connections in lists in the context of the same global transaction, which either commits the changes across all um, database connections or JMSQ, or it rollbacks all of them. Now, normally there were many standalone JTA transaction managers like Bitronics. This one was very popular like 10 years ago. There's also Atomicos. There's this Narayana from uh, Red Hat. And the thing is that if you have a, sp a Spring 5 project, using these um, global transaction managers. The thing is that this one is no longer working. Actually, this project was abandoned a very long time ago. And uh, you don't have, uh, Bitronics has been discontinued. Atomicos, which is a very popular solution for standalone transaction manager, doesn't have support for Jakarta transactions. So Jakarta transaction is uh, the equivalent is, is the new J JTA specification, just like uh, Jakarta Persistence is the new specification for JPA. And the only solution you have is to migrate to JBoss Narayana, which is also a transaction manager. That's exactly what I'm using this high, high performance Java Persistence uh, repository. I'm using uh, uh, Narayana. Previously, I was using Bitronics. But now I switched to Narayana because it's the only one currently that supports Jakarta transactions. So you'd have to, that's why I'm, I'm, I told you that the more dependencies you have, the more difficult it's going to make this migration because some, in some cases you might not have a choice, but either replace some dependency with some different dependency that can use this uh, Jakarta specification because there's, it's not only one. You have Jakarta persistence, Jakarta transactions. You have uh, you have even for the web. You have for validator. You have for Jcash. You have for a lot of uh, things. And um, the more dependencies you've been using, the the more it's going to um, affect this transition that you are going to do. Other things, minor things. For instance, in Spring Data, to this paging and sorting repository was extending the CRUD repository, and now it only extends the repository. So you no longer have the methods that were available before uh, in the CRUD uh, repository. So keep uh, keep that in mind. All right, so we managed to go through all the features that I discovered. There are many more. Uh, of course, it will take you much more than that, but we only have, we only have one hour to, to run this webinar. 
And uh, those are basically the uh, the things that I I went through when I migrated when I added support for uh, uh, for Hibernate six in um, in uh, which also requires Spring six as well in the Hypersystems Utils six point zero uh, module, and also when I migrated this high performance Java persistence, which is of, it's on GitHub. You can basically uh, you can basically get it there. One is this repository. The other one is the second, the, the, the next repository. Both of them have support for Hibernate and uh, Spring 6. So you can get there and see exactly what I did in the logs. Now, we also have this QR code for uh, feedback. If you want to provide a feedback for these sessions, it's going to help Pentabar um, where to, to better organize these events that we're running. And we still have time to answer the questions that you I see 30 of them. So we have plenty of time to, to go through, through them. Now I've seen that some of you have been also asking the questions on the chat. So let me take a quick look there. All right. So yes, yeah, someone uh, asks about uh, the session. Yes, it's being recorded as we're speaking and it's going to be shared. So if you didn't have the time or if you want to rewatch it, you can always uh, get, uh, it's going to be published on the Pentabar website. And uh, if you, just like you register for this, probably you're going to be notified uh, via email that uh, the recording was being published. So now let me take some questions from uh, from here. Let's see where we are left. All right, so JP3, JPQL can handle common table expressions with, yes. And not only that it can handle with queries, because now it has support for both derived tables and common table expressions. But in Hibernate 6.2, you have support for recursive common table expressions. So you can write JPQL and Criteria API queries that use recursive common table expressions, which are great for processing hierarchies. For instance, when you have something like post common that has a parent ID, foreign key column referencing to post common. So you have this hierarchy, which you then uh, rebuild and you reconstruct in SQL using recursive city. So you have them. You don't. You not only have it in. Uh, you don't have to necessarily do it using native SQL. Previously, your solution would be query DSL or Juke. Now you also have the alternative. Now is also JPQL. You you have it there. That's the one great benefit of this new parser. It has it has support for many features that were not possible before. And what's nice about it is that more and more features are going to be added. So the Hibernate team really does a great job for uh, in, in this regard related to that. So uh, I we, we should really appreciate. I, I haven't worked uh, for, for Hibernate for four years, but I still appreciate the work they are doing there because it's a very complex project. It's very difficult to add support for new things without breaking uh, without breaking anything. And uh, I think that uh, the fact that this project has been around for 22 years or uh, 22, yeah, 22 years already, it's quite uh, quite impressive. All right, query DSL is also parsed in JPQL string in Hibernate 5. I, I don't know about, uh, the thing is that about uh, JPQL, uh, uh, the, uh, no, sorry, uh, the query DSL, I have never used query DSL. I've only used Juke, so I'm not really sure how to answer this question. What does SQM abbreviation means? Yes, that's a um, semantic query model actually. And it's like a canonical, canonical model, which basically uh, both JPQL and Criteria API compile to, and then that one can generate uniquely the SQL query without having to parser for, for, the, for JPQL or something, or for Criteria API to add support for something that's only in, uh, in SQL. All right, related to UID, using integer long would cover much less entries than UID. Uh, no, not really. Like for instance, integer allows you to store like 4 billion entries. I don't know exactly what you're storing there, but if you're Facebook and Facebook has like 2 billion customers, you can store all of them using an int column. And when that's not possible, you can use a long. And long, that's 4 billion multiplied by 4 billion. I'm not sure that you will ever uh, reach that maximum size, which is extremely huge. Create native query is the best way. There are no, there is no, in this case, uh, one, a single best way. I, I, people would always want to have that. 
a single best way to cover everything. Unfortunately, there's no such thing. It always depends on the context. So native SQL queries are good for specific use cases, but then JPQL is also useful when you have to fetch entities that you plan to modify them. In that case, JPQL works much better than native SQL. But yes, for a non-trivial application, inevitably you'll have to use a lot of native SQL queries, which is fine. People say, but then why use Hibernate? Hibernate wasn't supposed to replace SQL? No. Who, who said that? Is, it, is that said in, in the Hibernate manual? Because that's not true at all. Hibernate goal was not to replace SQL. If that was true, then why do, does the entity manager have a create native query? Hibernate, uh, the Hibernate session had a create SQL query for 22 years. If it was supposed to replace SQL, why does it allow you to generate SQL queries? Because the goal of Hibernate, what was the goal of Hibernate? To have this persistence context and uh, um, pattern implemented uh, so that it provides an alternative to plain JDBC, which was available at the time. It's an alternative to active records or to other paradigms. That's what it does. It was not supposed to replace. It, it's impossible. It cannot replace something that you rely on. So uh, it really depends on what you need to do. What about name queries? You can also use name queries if you want. The fact that they are stored separately can have some advantages, but mostly they have disadvantages because whenever something breaks, you'll have to locate where is that one, do the change there. So basically it makes maintenance much harder, but there are also some advantages to, uh, to it as well. All right. Uh, what about adapting reactive support in Hibernate? Uh, Hibernate already has support for reactive. There is Hibernate reactive. It's a completely separate project which uses reactive. But reactive basically uh, has, uh, like with many other things, like with no SQL, with, uh, with many other things that keep on coming every now and then. Now, now the, uh, the fashionable thing is uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, everyone uh, uh, talks about it, will try to implement. It was blockchain was also very fashionable. You would do ev everything with blockchain. Uh, also, reactive was something like that, where people would say, oh, I really need to do reactive. But for what exactly? Because the entire internet was built on blocking IO and it, and it scales extremely well. I mean, Google was built on blocking IO. So YouTube did the same way. And it basically works very nicely. Facebook... Facebook uses MySQL and PHP, actually, and it works very, very nicely. It doesn't use any reactive. So then why would you need reactive for the vast majority of your Hibernate projects? Because you will not need it. You will need it when you have infinite streams of data that you have to consume. For those, reactive would always be a good solution. But that's a very tiny niche. That's why it never... Uh, caught up with the rest of the market and it's always remained a niche and it will always remain a niche so it was it was nice but actually a much uh, what is going to be uh, uh, actually a more impactful breakthrough would be Loom in Java where you'd get a lot of benefits that otherwise you would have from Reactive it's not one-on-one -on -one the same with Reactive but you have a lot of benefits that otherwise you would get from Reactive but in a way without compromising debugging and uh, uh, making your code much more maintainable. So that's my take on that. Maybe I'm wrong, but, but that's my take on that. We will let, uh, let's uh, wait and see if in five years, uh, my, my uh, m m uh, I, I, let's see if it, uh, my word stands true or not. Can you use Gradle dependency to override the dependency of Carta, Java, Card binary compatible? I'm not really sure. Probably, I'm not sure if uh, if you'd be able to only do it at runtime or something, or I don't know how that would work. But on, in the long run, you'd have to use the dependencies that have switched to Jakarta. Otherwise, probably it will not. I'm not sure if it uh, if it will work. Hibernate custom types. Type devs to be removed. Yes, it was uh, removed. There is no alternative to type dev. You'll just have to use type uh, type instead. All right. Does tuple transform automatically mean not having entity classes anymore? Or can they both exist? You can use it for both entity classes. And you can use it also for DTO. Basically, it's a way to transform the resource set, the default object 
uh, projection, which is the default projection, to to transform into any other object, to graph of objects in any any in any possible way. Is there is there an effective way Hibernate to catch database connection reception, like connection reset and sleep for a while and retry? Uh, you will never handle that nicely in Hibernate, but you can handle that very nicely in Spring, actually using Aspect. So yes, there is a way. Uh, if you want to take a look in that Hypersystems Util project that I told you about, you can find it in my GitHub uh, uh, project there. There is a retry annotation that tries to do exactly that. If you check it there, you will you'll see it. What to recommend between using Entity Manager Create Query and the query annotation? The query annotation is very nice. You can actually see the, light, the latest blog post that I wrote. It's exactly about that. The query annotation is nice when uh, you can execute everything and uh, uh, you can basically express all your query data access requirements inside the query annotation. And that's great. If you can do that, it's perfectly fine to use. But then there are many things that you cannot do with that, like applying the result transformer, which we talked about. You cannot do it like that or some other things combining in different uh, things or features that are not supporting in jpql query and for those use cases you would have to use a custom uh, spring data repository method where you'd have access to the entity manager and you can do uh, everything you want there our global transaction still proper approach in terms of performance uh, in uh, someone used to be throwing many years ago well it's not about performance, it's about requirements. If you have a requirement that requires global transaction, then you would have to use global transactions. Otherwise, as a rule of thumb, for the vast majority of projects, they can use Spring Boot, which defaults to the resource local, doesn't use JTA, and that's very that's sufficient for them. But for those projects which really need to use uh, global transactions, uh, I would say that, yes, this is a vibe. It's not about performance, it's more about the feature that it uh, provides. All right, what about extending JPA repository? Uh, I'm not sure what this one is about because you are always extending the JPA repository. I'm actually, actually that's not true. I'm not extending the JPA repository because JPA repository is, is a lousy implementation. It has find all, it has save, which can cause a lot of problems. So I'm using my own base JPA repository for hypersistence utils, which uses persist, uses merge. Uh, it uses, uh, it doesn't have any find all that uh, can basically fetch uh, any table from the database because if you provide uh, someone this uh, feature, they are, eventually they are going to use it and they will end up fetching 100,000 uh, 100, records and they will uh, question why it's working so slow. A project which uses spring data Solar, which is discontinued. Yes, uh, probably it's been discontinued because now a lot of people have migrated to Elasticsearch. So probably you'd have to migrate to something similar that uses uh, Elasticsearch as well. Whoa, man, uh, there are a lot of questions on the chat. All right, so I'm not sure if the organizers allow us to continue. I think there are not many questions uh, left. If we have time, uh, we can cover them otherwise uh, let me see so we have five more minutes uh, so i think that we can we can address all the questions we don't want to leave anyone uh, with their questions unanswered i think we missed spring uh, uh, aot uh, i didn't miss it actually i've never used it i also never use graal vm i've never actually seen anyone using it in production there are exactly uh, there are nice terms but i've never seen anyone really using them in a production environment. All the people that I'm training or I'm doing consulting for, you never use them in reality. So yes, probably if you if you can find uh, if you can find a, a use case for them, that would be great. So far, I haven't. It's a feature that I haven't actually needed so far. Uh, okay. Someone asked, what's the price of hypersense optimizer? It depends, but you can go on the website and see exactly. There are many, many pricing plans there. Any workaround on Jakarta namespace? For Jakarta namespace, actually, the, the only workaround is to use, make the change yourself in the code and then use the dependencies that migrate it to using Jakarta persistence. Otherwise, you'll have to use um, some alternatives. You have to use some other dependencies. 
for uh, text gist queries, native SQL queries, you can use for them. Commentary expression available for all database types. Well, they're available for all databases supporting them and you'd be surprised how many of them support them. Oracle, SQL Server, Oracle, MariaDB, uh, Postgres, MariaDB, MySQL, all of them have them nowadays. So these are some of the top uh, top DB2. So I would say the four, four or five top relational databases have support for them. So I'd say this is pretty universal. All right. You say Lombok is not a good new project. I've never used Lombok. I'm ne I will never use Lombok. There's nothing actually that Lombok offers me that otherwise uh, that I will really need. If I need to use something as compact as I would probably use records. But in reality, I've never been bothered by writing a DTO by myself because how many DTOs do you, you can really create in a project? I mean, and that even if you take all that time, that's going to be like 0.01% of all the time that you need to develop to or to maintain the project. And I would say focus, I try to focus on things that are really much more important and provide a much better return on investment, like creating integration tests, or uh, that would benefit way, way better than trying to, I don't know, save a couple of, uh, even for, for, for playing, like creating a POJO with IntelliJ IDEA, generating getter, setter, SQL, hash code, uh, would be easy, but in case of entities, using Lombok for equals and hash code is very is bad idea because you really need to uh, use some very specific implementations. You can find it on, on my blog. When you hibernate support key set pagination, Blaze Persistence has already has key set pagination. So basically, even if hibernate doesn't have it natively, you can use I've been using it via Blaze Persistence. Uh, basically, there's no there's no uh, disadvantage of using it. In fact, I'm already using Blaze Persistence for better criteria queries. So I'm not sure, probably they will add support for it uh, because uh, Christian Bakov uh, works on Hibernate. So probably he is going to add support for it sooner or later. But until then, I've never, I've never basically uh, was, um, I'm, I'm not, um, I don't think it's a limitation by using a different uh, dependency for things that Hibernate doesn't support. If I would believe that, I would have never created the Hypersystem Tools project. All right, so Spring Retry Mechanism is good for handling optimistic lock exception. Not that much for optimistic lock exception, more for recoverable exceptions, like for timeout lock acquisition exceptions, connection failures, and things like that. So I think that I managed to answer all the questions. And with that in mind, uh, thanks everyone for participating. Uh, again, this was recorded, so you are going to get the recording uh, when it's going to be uh, assembled and edited by um, um, Pentabar. So thanks Pen uh, Pentalog and Pentabar for uh, organizing this event and thank you for participating. And uh, I hope it was uh, useful for uh, for you and you can apply you can apply all those. In fact, there are many more. You can go to those projects which they are shared on github and you can basically go and see on the github uh, git log exactly what i've done if you search by hibernate 6 you will see exactly what i've done so uh, and you can use that as a reference for things because you will find examples for both spring 6 and hibernate 6 so if there's something that doesn't work for you and works there you can use that as a reference so again thanks for participating and uh I hope that you you are going to uh, apply some of the tips that I shared with you on uh, on this presentation. So take care.